thread that goes through all three of these stories, and we'll see what that thread is and see what lessons we can draw from it. But before we begin, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, I would not dare open your word without asking for your Holy Spirit to be here. Uh, lift Jesus up. May he be glorified in everything I say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The first of the three stories is the story of Elijah. And we find that story in 1 Kings 17 and 18. Elijah had stood firmly for God and had been victorious. Now he stands on top of Mount Carmel, having called the king, the priests of Baal, and the people of Israel to come and meet him there. He stood firmly as the king rides by in his chariot, glaring at Elijah, just wanting to give the command to strike him down, but restrained by God from doing so. Behind the king come the 450 priests of Baal, all dressed in their really sharp ecclesiastical wardrobes. Kind of reminds me of uh, last week, uh, Pope Benedict uh, had his, they had his funeral, and if you saw it, the, the cardinals there were all dressed in their red. They looked really sharp, that's the way these guys were. And behind them came all the people of Israel, fathers, mothers, children. They don't like the prophet because there had been no rain for three years. But they're called to the top of the mountain and now standing in front of that assembly, Elijah proposes that a test should happen that would give evidence of who the true God was and help the people decide who they should worship. A very simple test, really, because Mrs. White actually says in Prophets and Kings, page 148, it, it was a proposal so reasonable. We have a God who is a reasonable God. Amen. That the people could not well evade it. Each side would build an altar, place a sacrifice on it, pray, and the God that answers the prayer would be the God that they would serve. So simple, yet so profound. And in verse 23, the Bible says the people answered, what you say is good. And we know how the story unfolded. The prophets of Baal went first. They built their altar. They dressed it. They put a sacrifice on it. And they began their incantations, their prayers, their chants. It was probably the first Pentecostal service on record. <laughs> They walked around and around. They even began to cut themselves and blood began to flow. By midday, it got to the point, and I, I don't think this is in the Amazing Facts manual of how to conduct an evangelistic series, but Elijah began to taunt them and say, where's your God? Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's asleep. Yell out and so they did. It just made them more anxious, mad. And on it went until late in the afternoon, until finally, after hours of attempts, they gave up their, their attempt to have their God call down fire. And it says it came to the time of the evening sacrifice and so then it was Elijah's turn and he took the 12 stones he put the 12 stones together he put a sacrifice on it and then he poured buckets of water on top of the sacrifice to make sure that no one could say that there was any trickery to what was about to happen and then Elijah says to the people come close because God is a God who wants to be close to each of us and he offers a very simple prayer. It was not long, drawn out, but straight to the point. We read it in, in verse 36, where it says, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, O Lord, our God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. And immediately, if you, I like to 
try to use my imagination. A continuous stream of fire comes down from heaven, devouring the sacrifice, licking up the water, and so hot that it even melts the 12 stones that the sacrifice were put on, and the ground is level. Picking up again uh, in Prophets and Kings, it says, the brilliancy of the blaze illuminates the mountain and dazzles the eyes of the multitude. And Elijah, through God, had attained yet another great spiritual victory. The prophets of Baal are put to death. The people's hearts are turned to God. But you know, sometimes change comes quickly. The story continues with Elijah climbing to the top of the mount, Mount Carmel, bending to the ground and praying, and he tells his servant, go look out towards the sea. And he does this six times. Each time he comes back, nothing, sir, or master, or whatever he called him. And so there has to be a lesson there about perseverance of prayer. Because he prays the seventh time, he says, go and look again. And when he comes back, he tells Elijah, well, there's a small cloud. And Elijah knew in that instant, rain was coming. So he tells Ahab, get your horse and get back to the palace. But the rain comes too quick. And it's raining so hard the horse can't go. And the Bible says again in 1 Kings 18, 46, that the power of the Lord came upon Elijah and he ran ahead of Ahab's chariot, guiding the horse all the way back to the palace. Can you imagine? You guys probably remember Secretariat, the greatest racehorse ever. He won the Belmont, I think, by 32 lengths. Can you imagine somebody running right along, a man running right next to the Secretariat? Yeah. This is just trivia. This is <laughs> trivia. You know why Secretariat was such a great horse? His heart was bigger than normal horses. I learned that from a guy that uh, his family were into racehorses, and he told me that. He had a bigger heart. So he could pump more blood. That's why he ran so fast. But that's just a trivia point there. So Elijah takes him back to the palace. He finds a place of shelter to lie down. And Ahab goes in the palace to find his dear, dear wife, Jezebel. So he has to inform her, dear, uh, this is what happened. And oh, by the way, your 450 prophets have been killed. Jezebel was enraged, so angry that she sent a message to Elijah. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, by this time tomorrow, if I do not make your life like one of them. You've heard the expression, you're going to learn, you're going to live to regret that? Uh-uh, not with her. She really should not have said that. That was the wrong thing for her to say. But Elijah receives the message that was sent to him, and a strange thing happens. Immediately, fear grips his heart, and it was off to the races. With all that Elijah had gone through, with all the vic victories he had accomplished, you would have think that Elijah's or Jezebel's verbal threat would roll right off his back. You would think that his response might be something like, hey, you deal with God because I've done exactly what God told me to do. Instead, with the threat, Elijah's faith disappears in an instant. And the question I think everyone asks who reads this story is, how could a person who has been experiencing one spiritual victory after another for the past three years allow his faith to evaporate so quickly? Elijah had been the target of death threats for the last three years. His face was on wanted signs, dead or alive, all over Israel. And on this day, he stood unafraid before the king, who had the power to put him to death if God did not intervene. God, through Elijah, had performed many miracles. His prayer had stopped the rain. He was protected and fed by ravens. Through the power of God, he had raised the boy from the dead. He demonstrated to all who the true God was and had led a revival in Israel. And now, the pressure exerted on him by a woman's verbal threat nullifies what should have been an immovable, faith-filled individual. J 
Jezebel, a queen, who represented in a very real way both the political system of the day, she was the queen, and she represented the false religious system of the day. The 450 uh, priests of Baal were hers. And the combination of those two systems exert pressure on Elijah that seems to crush him to the point of giving up. And we read in 1 Kings 19.4 that he goes to God and he says, God, Lord, I, I've had enough. Take my life. You know better than my ancestors. So what happened to Elijah's faith? The question is relevant today. It's relevant to all of us who are looking forward to the soon coming of Jesus. How could change happen so quickly in Elijah's faith? But let, before we answer, let's go to story number two. This story is found in all the Gospels. In John, it's chapter 18, and Mark is 26, and Luke is 22, and, and well, Mark is 14, I'm sorry, Matthew is 26. The disciples were in the upper room with Jesus. They had just completed eating the Lord's Supper, and according to John 18, 1, they left and crossed the Kindred Valley and entered into a garden, which we know was the Garden of Gethsemane. They loved Jesus. He was their friend. He was their Lord. He was the center of their lives. They would give their life for him. They had been with him the past three years. They saw the miracles. They heard the sermons. They had the privilege to witness the love of God more than any other group ever had. And they were even given the ability through the Holy Spirit to cast out demons. They had seen dead people raised to life. You would think they should have had a faith that withstood any attack. But we read, we go to the Gospel of Luke in the 22nd chapter, starting at verse 40. And on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew a stone stroke beyond them and knelt down and prayed. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. But the phrase that I've been using repeatedly, the title of my sermon is what? Sometimes change comes quickly. And we see it once more that when the church and state join together, not only can they become a persecuting power, they undoubtedly will become a persecuting power that will exert pressure on God's people. It happened with Elijah, and it happens once more now in the story of the disciples. The spiritual leaders of the day came to arrest Jesus, and they joined with the political powers of that day to kill him. And how did the disciples respond? They became cowards. They forgot their master. They had no inclination about his well-being, and without hesitation, they threw Jesus under the bus and left him all alone. And we can read that in Mark 14, 50, where it says they all deserted it. And once again, we're faced with this rather uncomfortable question. Could the church and state combine together cause me to let go of my faith as easily as the disciples did? You know, we've seen things happen in this country the last three years that I would have never thought was possible four years ago. We've just come through a pandemic, and we've seen in this country, a country that was built around individual rights, built around the idea that we can worship the way we want, built on religious freedom, and we've seen that we now have a government that has no problem at all in taking those rights away. Our government demonstrated over the last three years it does not care about your personal convictions. And it will trample your rights by using four little words that you'll hear more often in the future, for the common good. When you hear that term, your ears should perk up. Because this country is going to enact laws that will combine the political powers with the prevailing religious system that will go contrary to our individual conscience. 
In fact, I'm not even sure they will even enact laws in a legal way. In my mind, the most likely scenario is that they will declare some sort of emergency and use what they call emergency power. Do you know that Biden just eight days ago extended the COVID-19 state of emergency? Why? Right. Does anyone remember the federal government or the state government going through the process of enacting laws regarding mask requirements, lockdowns, or mandatory COVID vaccinations? No. The government acted arbitrarily and simply said that we're going to do this for your own good. In this country, there's four ways laws are made. First way laws are made is that Congress can make laws. The House and the Senate, they get together, they make a law, they send it to the president, if he likes it, he signs it, it becomes law. Second way, the president has executive powers. He can write laws, and sometimes those laws stand up under scrutiny, other times they don't. The third way laws are developed is through the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court can change laws, and we saw that last summer with Roe versus Wade. And then the fourth way is that each state has the ability to write laws, usually when they're in an executive session. Maryland is now in an executive session and they're writing laws and bills. But did that happen when COVID came along? No, not at all. Never happened. Governors, mayors, police chiefs, they issued shelter and place orders. They closed businesses that they deemed non-essential. They banned gatherings, including church and political assemblies. Some places banned anything outdoors. This is a true story. You can look it up in Google, so you know in Google it's <laughs> got to be true. <laughs> out in Santa Fe, or Santa Cruz, California, a young man was out surfing 200 yards out in the ocean, away from anybody, and the police were on the shore going, hey, get in here. Don't you know there's COVID? <laughs> they made the man come in, <laughs> and he went around anybody. In another place, this is, this is a true story too, in Greenville, Mississippi, a church rented a drive through movie theater and the people were sitting in their individual cars with just their family and somebody was up, I guess, at the screen speaking and their mayor, who was a dimwit, oh, maybe I shouldn't say dimwit, <laughs> up in the pulpit. Well, Elijah called, you know, Elijah called them names, but anyway, this mayor, he sent the police and said, you know, if the cars didn't leave, you find every car $500. Uh, they actually sued and they won, which I'm, I'm glad they did. But it's kind, of, it's kind of strange because at the same time, liquor stores remained open because they were considered essential. We have to have our liquor, right? <laughs> now, I'm not making the point that at the beginning of the pandemic, sheltering it in place was a terrible thing to happen to people. In fact, in the beginning of a worldwide pandemic, it was probably the wise thing to do for the majority of people to distance themselves from each other. But what I am saying is that the government and certain individuals in particular who love power acted in such a way to demonstrate disdain for people's individual rights and they had no reluctance to use force to coerce compliance. This was especially true with COVID. Vaccines came along. Now I'm not getting into the point, should you have taken the vaccine, should you not? If you took the vaccine, you did not get the mark of the beast. And if you did not take the vaccine, you're not one of the 144,000. <laughs> the issue is this. If you were a person who believed that God did not want you to introduce the vaccine into your body, that the Holy Spirit was telling you not to take it, the government has no right to tell you that you had to take it or you'd lose your job. There were thousands of nurses, and this is really strange because there were thousands of nurses up in New York City, doctors, health care workers, first care responders who refused the vaccine, lost their jobs. Now, these were the same people who were taking care of COVID patients before the vaccines yeah. came out, and some of them got COVID, and they were looked upon as heroes. But once the vaccine came out and they refused, they said, no, I have natural antibodies, that they, were, they were thrown out the door. Yeah. People, we're living in a time when the government of the United States is becoming an authoritarian government. 
and will soon attempt to coerce your conscience in regards to the way you worship. I really believe that COVID was a dry run. I believe God allowed COVID to become the pandemic that it did so that we could see exactly what this government not only could do, but will do. And not this government only, but all the governments around the world. You look at England, you look at Canada, you look at Australia. I think Canada was worse than us. Their prime minister is a real piece of work. I mean, the truckers up there, who refused the vaccine and they weren't doing anything illegal. They, they uh, closed their bank accounts. They couldn't buy food. They couldn't pay their mortgage. We're, I, folks, what's happened should be a wake up call for every church member that what the Bible says will happen prior to the coming of Christ is indeed going to happen. Amen. We have a very real need to take the blinders off and realize that the issues that are building in this country right now are not going to be fixed by either political party and that we must keep our eyes fixed on Christ if we are to be victorious. Amen. Amen. I see one political article after another that says democracy is on the line and I believe they're probably right but it doesn't matter if Democrats or Republicans are in charge because the time is coming to an end and that government, regardless of who is in charge, will become a persecuting government to the people of God yes. who have faith in Jesus. And it leads me back to the original question. When this government becomes that persecuting power that we all know it will be, will my faith, will your faith, hold strong or will we fall the same way Elijah did and the same way the disciples did? Now we come to the third story. And this story is the story that should give us hope. I would not leave you with a negative idea that failure is an absolute certainty. I've used the phrase over and over that change can come quickly. And indeed it can. But change doesn't necessarily have to be negative with God. Positive change can occur in a person's life as quickly and totally, just as easily as negative Amen. change. Amen. And this is the story of the disciples after the resurrection. And you'll have to forgive me because from now on, I'm either going to be reading scripture or reading something from Mrs. White. We start out in John 20, 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, the disciples were initially in hiding. They were cowards. They were confused. They had no answers. And then Jesus reveals himself to his disciples and stays with them for 40 days. Now we go to Acts 1-4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now we go back to the spirit of prophecy in Acts of Apostles chapter 4. In obedience to Christ's command, they waited in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, the outpouring of the Spirit. They did not wait in idleness. The record says they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. They also met together to present their request to the Father in the name of Jesus. In solemn awe, they bowed in prayer, repeating the assurance. The Spirit came upon the waiting, praying disciples with a fullness that reached every heart. The infinite one revealed himself in power to the church. It was as if for ages this influence had been held in restraint, and now heaven rejoiced in being able to pour out upon the church the riches of the Spirit's grace. We now go back to the scripture, Acts 2.1. When the day of Pentecost came, there came together in one place, suddenly a sound like the blowing of the violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
But much, much more happened to these men than just the ability to speak other languages. Everything changed. Everything about their life changed in an instant. Change came quickly. Remember, these 11 men, just 50 days earlier, these men not only abandoned Jesus, not only did they allow their faith to disappear, they demonstrated how cowardly they were. They were timid. They were hiding. And now 50 days later, the Holy Spirit comes on them, and we read this from the Acts of the Apostles. Under the training of Christ, the disciples had been led to feel their need for the Spirit. Under the Spirit's teaching, they received the final qualification and went forth to their life work. No longer were they ignorant and uncultured. No longer were they a collection of independent units or discordant conflicting elements. No longer were their hopes set on worldly greatness. They were of one accord, of one heart, and of one soul. Christ filled their thoughts. The advancement of his kingdom was their aim. In mind and character, they had become like their master, and then took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. People, ch people change can come quickly if the Holy Spirit comes into your life. Amen. Amen. We read this in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 209. Pray for the Spirit in the time of the latter rain. We cannot depend upon the form or external machinery. What we need is the quickening influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Not by, not by might nor by power, but by spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Pray without ceasing and watch by working in accordance with your prayer. As you pray, believe, Christ, trust in God. It is the time of latter rain when the Lord will give largely of his spirit. Be fervent in prayer and watch in the spirit. Remember Peter just 50 days earlier? He denied the Lord three times. Faith was gone. Hope was gone. But now with the Holy Spirit, 50 days later, with the Holy Spirit, he preaches one of the most powerful sermons recorded in Scripture. And in Acts 4.13, we read, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. God. Folks, I'm not one to encourage people to make New Year's resolutions, mainly because I don't keep them. I think I've made the resolution to lose weight for the last 10 years, and I think I probably gained 5 pounds on average every year. <laughs> <laughs> but we do need to make a resolution that we ask God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. What is it that we need the Holy Spirit for? There's so many things. We need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to our, what our spiritual condition is. We need to ask God for the Holy Spirit to give us repentance. We need to ask God for the Holy Spirit to show us what defects in character we have. We need, need to ask God for the Holy Spirit to remove pride from our hearts. We need to ask God for the Holy Spirit to take the love of the world away. We need to ask God for the Holy Spirit to give us a right view of God. And I could go on. Amen. I could go on with more reasons why we need the Spirit, but I think you get the picture. Now back to the book Acts of Apostles. Since this is the means by which we are to receive power, why do we not hunger and thirst for the gift of the Spirit? Why do we not talk of it? Pray for it and preach concerning it. The Lord is more than willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who serve him than parents are to give good gifts to their children. For the daily baptism of the Spirit, every worker should offer his petition to God. Amen. Folks, I know we talk about the work of sanctification being a work of a lifetime, and indeed it is. Uh, there are are areas in my life that I know that need to change. But a time is coming when the latter rain is going to be poured out on God's people prior to Christ's return. And only those who have been seeking for the Holy Spirit prior to that will receive the latter rain. Those who receive it, change will not only come quickly, it will be complete. And they will be a people ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Amen. My prayer is that each one here will begin to ask God every day for the Spirit. And that you will allow the Holy Spirit to lead you into a closer walk with Jesus. 
and may God be with you in this endeavor. Amen. Amen. The closing song is page 294.